All right, ninth grade, what is an arthropod? Characteristics of arthropods. A typical arthropod is a segmented coelomate, invertebrate animal with bilateral symmetry, an exoskeleton, and jointed structures called appendages. I'll come back to uh, the importance and the function of appendages, but one of the first things that I want you to notice here is this idea of an exoskeleton. And so arthropods are considered the most successful animal group of all time, meaning that they have the greatest distribution, the greatest diversity and sheer numbers uh, on this planet. And their success lies in their exoskeleton. Not so much for protection, your book mentions that, but primarily as leverage like your skeleton for muscle attachment. And so they were able to withstand gravity deal with hard surfaces, uh, lift their bodies, transport themselves far and wide, and live in all sorts of circumstances that most creatures could not. And so their success lies primarily in their exoskeleton first, and then also in the fact that they have these segments and these pinches, these joints, these hinges inside of their body, uh, um, well, outside of their body for the inside of their body, to exert force. And so they're among the first creatures to use a partnership between soft and hard tissue for the point of creating more strength, more leverage, and more power. If you did simple machines in middle school, like levers and pulleys, first, second, and third class levers, uh, this is what we're talking about in terms of biomechanics with arthropods. And so that is what leads to their greatest success on the planet. So they have not only an exoskeleton, but that skeleton is segmented. And one of the first creatures ever to accomplish this in the fossil record, one of the ancestors of all arthropods, is considered the trilobite. Now you have seen one of these in our fossil lab. And if you'll look at this, this is a nice intermediary between segmented worms and arthropods. If you're looking for a missing link, if you think about it, here's a creature with repeating segments in its body. Um, but it is an arthropod uh, made of repeating units, and modern arthropods will reduce this down to basically three sections of their body, a head, thorax, and abdomen. Okay, And then if you combine the first two, you get a cephalothorax. So remember that head, thorax, and abdomen evolved from these multiple repeating units. One of the things that we need to pay attention to with these arthropods is that they have fantastic nervous systems. Um, they have complex bodies, very good senses, and all of these things were coordinated in appendages. So looking at this picture of a lobster, you can have fun trying to count the number of appendages. An appendage is any structure that projects off of the body of the animal, and it is used primarily for three things, sensing, walking and feeding and then sometimes mating so sensing sensing walking feeding and then sometimes mating and so you can look around this picture of a lobster and start counting and guessing how many appendages we have here eyes two sets of antenna pinchers swimming flaps legs mandibles you name it and so arthropods have really acute and strong senses. They have efficient gas exchange. They have well-developed nervous systems, compound eyes, malphigian tubules, mandibles, stingers. And so the first group we come to are the chelicerophorms. The ancient form of them is the horseshoe crab. You can see the scorpion, dust mites, ticks, fleas, and then of course spiders. And so spiders are pretty popular right now, with uh, thanks to Tom Holland and the, the Avengers. And so anyway, uh, you will actually do a lab on spider web building. And one of the things that I'll want you to focus on is spider anatomy. Um, worldwide, there are about 35,000 different species of arachnids, of spiders. Only 12 species are harmful to humans. And in North America, in Texas, of course, only two that you need to worry about, the black widow, the female primarily, and of course the brown recluse. Uh, both are common. You can see black widows in your garages pretty easily. And then, uh, oh my gosh, the brown recluse, this little bitty, you know, two centimeter kind of guy, 
He likes to live in warm, moist areas like shoes and underneath um, areas in your kitchen. So watch out for them. Learn how to identify what they look like. So you'll see this anatomy picture again sometime soon on a Jupiter pod. And I'll want you to reproduce the anatomy structures here. I should have already sent you the label picture. Or you can look on your Google Classroom and see the permanent document in one of my previous posts. But get to know this thing. It has a book lung. It has a strong heart. still open circulatory system. It has those chelicera, those fangs. And so we are going from gills to lungs. And uh, it's got simple eyes, petty palps meant for handling prey. I'm going to load up a video about spider silk uh, on Jupiter, which I want you to watch and uh, start to learn the proteins. Or No, you should have already done that so you can get to know uh, the cool chemistry of spider silk. And if we could make a shirt out of spider silk, you're basically looking at a bulletproof Under Armour shirt. It would still hurt, but it wouldn't penetrate the shirt. Absolutely amazing stuff. From the Chelly Sarah, we're going to advance to the Myriapoda. Uh, there you have centipedes and millipedes. If you look at the picture of these two, a centipede has one leg on each side of its segment, where millipedes have two legs on each side of their segment. Centipedes are carnivores, millipedes are herbivores. The first creature to come out of the water onto land was a millipede, a giant millipede, about the size of a you know a tree trunk of a fallen log, if you will. Um, but a millipede nonetheless, because it was going after plants that came onto land first and trying to get away from carnivores. So there you go. There's your little trivia for millipedes. So learn how to identify them. The most so arthropods represent the most successful animal phyla of all time. Within that group, the hexapods, what you know of as bugs, common insects, where they have uh, basically six legs and three body segments, most of them are winged. They are the most successful of the arthropods and of the most successful insects, the most successful hexapods are beetles. They'd be a good animal to name a uh, rock and roll band out of. And so hexapods are probably what most of y'all are familiar with. Um, so name it butterflies, grasshoppers, beetles, ants. Uh, let me keep going here off the dragonflies, damselflies, mosquitoes, on and on. So they are the most diverse, the most numerous type of arthropod on the planet. And I just wanted to tell you beetles are the most successful of that group. So one of the things I want you to know about insects is that uh, they are sexually dimorphic. All of these things are still protostomes, if you remember that term. They all have open circulatory systems, but we are now making the transition to bilateral creatures with lungs. They have an open circulatory system and an open respiratory system with malphigian tubes and tracheal tubes. But... Um, we are pushing the boundaries and getting closer and closer to the complexity that we're used to. And so all insects will be sexually dimorphic and then we'll go through certain changes in their lifetime. Um, some of these hexapods have complete metamorphosis, which means the larva and the adult look completely different. This is not a primitive form of insect development. This is actually a niche or a specialization for development where the juveniles do not compete with the adults. They can live in the same habitat, but have a different niche, if you remember that conversation from the beginning of the year. So caterpillars eat leaves and butterflies you know, drink nectar, but they can live in the same spot, even on the same plant, if you will, and not compete directly. Where, and most insects go through complete metamorphosis. A small minority of insects go through incomplete metamorphosis where it goes egg larva, uh, egg, egg larva, nymph, adult. They don't ever go through like a cocoon, a chrysalis, or anything like that. Um, they just are smaller versions of the adults. This is a concern where they'll compete with the adults for food. The weird thing about most insects that go through incomplete metamorphosis is that they are typically solitary creatures. But if you've ever heard of swarms of locusts, locust plagues, grasshopper plagues, cricket plagues, they're usually solitary, but for some reason, the more they come in contact with each other, 
the more they become like a, um, a herd or a group animal and they behave as one in large groups. But it all has to do with physical touch. Just a weird bit of trivia about why sometimes in Denton County you get cricket plagues, these huge cricket swarms. They follow each other everywhere, but normally they're solitary creatures. So I'll load another YouTube video about um, a dragonfly basically um, emerging uh, from incomplete metamorphosis into an adult dragonfly on one of your future pods. You won't have to know anything about uh, grasshopper anatomy. I just wanted to show that to you. So if we leave land and come into the into the water, back into the marine, coming full circle here, we'll come to the marine arthropods, what you know of as crustaceans, um, crabs, mussels. There's a big sign in Denton County about zebra mussels invading our lakes and shrimp. So uh, they are the most successful creatures in the water along with the mollusks. <clears throat> and so not much to say here. You know what a crustacean is. It's just a marine arthropod, but basically a lobster is a giant water bug. You wouldn't eat grasshoppers or cockroaches, but we'll all eat shrimp and lobster, but you just need to know they're all bugs. Some live in the water, some live in our houses, unfortunately. So you enjoy those water bugs. I like them fried with uh, French fries. Anyway, uh, one of the things I want to do as we end this segment is we leave arthropods and make a jump over to echinoderms. They are invertebrates, but the thing is, is that they're chordates. They're invertebrate chordates. Now we're a chordate and they're a chordate, but they're invertebrates and we're vertebrates. So here we are making another transition. They start their life as a bilateral larva. They end their life as an adult radial creature, radial symmetry. And the word echinoderm just means spiny skin. Now, we cross another line with these guys. Not only are they coelomates like us, not only are they um, chordates like us, but they are finally, we got there, they're deuterostomes. They develop like us as an embryo. These things include sea stars, the brittle stars, sea urchins, sea lilies, uh, and sea cucumbers. You'll see pictures of them in just a minute. But in terms of development and closeness, in terms of genetic similarity, we are sneaking right up to something like us, even though it looks nothing like us on the surface. They have multiple arms. They have a vascular system where they primarily use water for uh, structure and transport. They have a calciferous endoskeleton. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what we have. And so the thing is, they just switch from bilateral to radial through their development. So the echinoderms are important to us. They are separate. We are leaving gradually invertebrates. They're, they still are an invertebrate, but we're at the tail end of that discussion. And they are really important to us uh, because of their development, their orientation, and the process they go through in maturity. Uh, they go through the exact same process that we do, just that their genetics uh, make a different recipe, have a different code for what the body should look like. <clears throat> So here's an elaborate description of these guys. The gross one, uh, I'll show you a video of what the starfish, the, you know, the sea stars do and how they eat. They're gross. They stick out their stomach and digest externally. Sand dollars are another member of this group. But the sea cucumbers are disgusting. Uh, if scared, they have replicas of their internal organs. They'll rupture their body and spill out their organs so that the predator eats the organs and they'll just regenerate new ones. So glad we're not evolved from these things. If someone said boo to you in the hallway or scared you or maybe you had a pop quiz, uh, that would be a disgusting scenario to try and clean up. So the ones that you're most familiar with, though, will be sand dollars. You know, they had their fleshy uh, exterior removed when they died and they leave that endoskeleton, that calciferous skeleton behind and you can collect those. And then, of course, you know all about Sea stars, starfish. Um, so I'll put a YouTube video up on that as well, probably later this week or next week, because we're going to take our time. So this whole talk is about 17 minutes. I am going to put it on Jupiter, but I'll leave it up for a few days. You can watch it over a few days in segments. You just have to advance the YouTube video. That way you can get your attendance. And I'll put a question or two at the end, maybe. Um, but this is really just for your learning. I am not so concerned about points. Um, our school has not gone to pass-fail. We're still taking grades, so I want you to take it seriously. 
It's just I'm trying to keep it lean and mean for this weird situation that we're in. And so when you see the video um, for Sea Stars, that'll be like five minutes. This one's 17 minutes, and I recommend you divide it up over a couple days if you want. So coming full circle, when we started this whole process with sponges, you saw a little cartoon version of SpongeBob. Well, uh, that's probably a bit dated. I don't know if y'all grew up on SpongeBob or if you still watch them. But here we are with Sea Stars. Um, you, you don't need to learn their anatomy. You don't need to worry about labeling them so much. But in each one of their rays, they have a different organ set, even though they look the same on the outside, inside. They have different organs. And so we started with SpongeBob with Periphera with sponges, and so we end with Patrick. No, I don't watch SpongeBob. I've probably seen two episodes, but I think Patrick is probably one of my favorite characters out there just because he's dumb and happy. And so we'll end this with the idea of chordates, a tunicate that's an invertebrate, but it has a central nerve cord, but it has radial symmetry. It goes through development unlike us, but ends in a different spot like us, similar to starfish. But we'll pick that up when we start dealing with chordates as we slowly sneak up to vertebrates. So the tunicate is kind of our go-between, and those are, uh, those are our stopping point for today. So, all that said, again, watch this lecture over two or three times. Um, for your attendance, I will leave it up on Jupiter for a while. You can do it all in one sitting, but I would recommend that you use it for some of your attendance issues because I'm not going to put a lot of things up and we are going to slow this down and do this, uh, this section over this week and next week. What we'll do next week at some point, or maybe after you turn in your uh, SciFair stuff, is I'll do a Google Classroom, a Google Meet, where we can do a uh, review. If you want to join that, and I'll say a bunch of stuff, you can ask me a bunch of questions, and we'll do as best we can to get you ready for some kind of an online Jupiter test that I'll have you take. Don't worry about that. Just do your best, and everything will be okay. All right, guys. Well, that's it, and I will talk to you later.